Good morning again and a happy Sabbath to one and all. I pray God's blessings uh, are with you and will continue to follow you all the days of your lives. We thank God for another Sabbath, for another opportunity that we can come together and worship him, give him the honor and the glory that he deserves. And I pray that today again we will hear a word from the Lord and that he will fill our hearts with the joy of knowing and of serving him. And so uh, without any further delay, we're going to take our Bibles and we're going to consider our scripture passage for this morning as we turn to the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 1, and we'll consider for today's message uh, verses 12 through 15. Joshua chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. Joshua chapter 1, verses 12 through 15, and it reads, I'm reading from the New King James Version, it says, And the Reubenites, the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, to the Reubenites, the Gadites and half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua spoke, saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, the Lord your God is giving you rest and is giving you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side Jordan. But you shall pass over your you shall pass before, sorry, your brethren armed all your mighty men of valor and help them. You shall pass over before your brethren armed and all your mighty men of valor and help them until the Lord has given your brethren rest as he gave you and they also have taken possession of the land which the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and enjoy it, which Moses, the Lord's servant, gave you on this side of the Jordan toward the sunrise. I would like to put a caption on today's message and call it, I've got mine let's go get yours. I've got mine, let's go get yours. Please bow your heads with me as we pray. Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for the direction that you've given us in your word. And now I pray, Father, that as you've spoken to me, that now you speak through me. I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit will be the one who speaks. I pray that your voice will be heard and the, that the words that come from my mouth will come, from, from, will come directly from you. I pray, Father, that we will be encouraged today and every day to take heed to what you have given to us so that we might be better disciples and be better prepared to make disciples. And we pray, Father, that in the end, that this reward, this inheritance that is promised to all of us, we will receive, not because we've been selfish, but because when we've gotten ours, we can help others to also get theirs. We pray, Lord, that uh, you would pardon us for our mistakes and shortcomings. And again, Father, speak to us today. Convince and convict our hearts so that we might do and be what you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray and we thank you. And we say, Amen. Amen. <coughs> Uh, we, we may remember just a few years ago the trickle-down economics that was touted. It was a proposition to stimulate the economy by relieving taxes on businesses and on the, wealthy, on, on the wealthy. And the idea was that when you do that, that the wealth will trickle down, will trickle down from the businesses and from the wealthy down to everybody else. Now, while this idea was being touted, uh, by those who are of a certain political persuasion, uh, we heard them go further to explain the fairness uh, and equity of their proposition. Uh, they believe 
that since they worked hard to put themselves in the positions that they were, since they worked hard to put themselves in good economic standing, they believed and they suggested that it would be unfair for them to be punished uh, by giving back to those who did not have the same fortunes as they did. And so they insisted that everyone had the same opportunities for success. If they would follow the same formula, they said, uh, they would have the same types of success. But I don't think that they considered that some of us begin at a different point in the proverbial race. Or that some of us do not have a real opportunity to win this race. In fact, the truth is that some of us don't even get a real shot at even joining the race. But on the other hand, uh, there was another suggestion to stimulate the economy. The opposite of trickle down. Trickle up, in fact. Uh, this way the economy will be stimulated when corporations and the wealthy are required to give back to the system that allowed them uh, their good fortunes. Uh, they would pay higher taxes. Uh, the way that I've understood this concept is that it does not mean that the less fortunate would receive handouts or entitlements, as some put it, but that there would be opportunities that would be created for them to succeed. Uh, they would receive the help that uh, would allow them to get the education that would allow them to complete the, uh, sorry, to compete for jobs. Uh, they would get assistance with childcare so that they would, would not have to worry about their children's safety when they are in school or at work. Uh, it would mean that the best teachers would be put in the systems and in the neighborhoods that needed them most. That the economy would stimulate uh, education and equal education for all. Everyone would have access to affordable health care. And these are just some of the su suggestions, some of the ideas and benefits uh, that were shared. But what I found to be most disappointing was that this idea was rebutted and refuted and rejected by a political party, many of whose adherents claim to be Christians. They identified with the idea that God blessed them to be the head and not the tail, and that anyone who wanted to be in their position just needed to work a little bit harder and a little bit smarter, and they too could become the head. They seem to have forgotten that for some of, some of, uh, some of us, or for some of them, their wealth was really ill-gotten gains. They seem to have forgotten that someone somewhere helped them to get to their position. They seem to have forgotten that while they had the opportunity to get an education, some had to work for far less than minimum wage because they were not qualified to do, the, uh, to do much more or, or were not given the opportunity to be better. Uh, they seem to have forgotten the history of 400 years of slavery and the consequent prejudices that follows people of African, of African descent in America. Uh, they seem to have forgotten that their wealth was established when Africans were forced to farm the fields and denied the opportunity to be educated while their own ancestors made sure that their progeny reaped the benefits. They seem to have forgotten that in this country, they were taught that black Americans were only three-fifths of a person, that black Americans have always fought for the right to be considered human in this country. Maybe they didn't realize their own hypocrisy because they were taught uh, history by the so-called victors and not the true story of how their ancestors cheated and lied and pillaged everywhere they went. And they certainly continue to excuse their behavior whenever they are caught uh, uh, breaking their own rules or not applying them equally to everyone. And like I said, the most damning part the most damning part of it all 
is that many who hold to these ideas of wealth trickling down consider themselves Christians. But these are the ones who take certain texts and they interpret them in a way to suit themselves. They take the word of God and interpret it in a way that allows them to excuse their behavior. Uh, but I want us to consider two passages of scripture before we focus on our main text uh, for today. The first one is in Matthew chapter 23, verses 34 through 40. It says, But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him, this is Jesus they're talking to, asked him, testing him, saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And then Jesus said, on, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, Jesus said, hang all the law and the prophets. Now Jesus was being tested by the religious leaders concerning the scriptures. And by the way, who better to explain the scriptures than the word himself? The scribes and Pharisees, they were considered the experts at interpreting and applying the scriptures to life. But both groups had been getting it wrong. You see, they had been more concerned with and focused on their relationship with God while they neglected their relationship with their fellow men. Now, there's nothing wrong with focusing your attention on your relationship with God. But there's no way that you can focus your attention on your relationship with God without paying attention to your fellow men. In fact, the Bible tells us how can we claim to love God and not care about our fellow men. And so that's why Jesus said, that the law and the prophets, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This, he said, is a first and great commandment, but the second is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So the second verse, second verse I want us to a passage I, I want us to pay attention to is in Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. And because of the, uh, the, in the interest of time, we'll not read the whole thing, but uh, the idea here, um, Jesus is saying, Jesus is talking about what it would be like on Judgment Day. On Judgment Day, Jesus says, he says that on that day, he will separate the, those who will be lost and those who would be saved. Uh, on the left, he will place those who are lost, and on the right, those who are saved. But he will judge them, both groups, with the same criteria. You fed me when I was hungry. You gave me drink when I was thirsty. You took me in when I was a stranger. You clothed me when I was naked. You visited me when I was sick. You came to me when I was in prison. A and conversely, he will say the same thing to the other group, the group on the left. Except this time he adds the negative. You did not feed me when I was hungry. Nor did you give me drink when I was thirsty. You did not uh, take me in when I was a stranger. You, you did not clothe me when I was naked. You, you did not visit me when I was in prison. Now note that these are the standards that Jesus, Jesus said that these are the standards that he will use to judge all of us. Notice that he did not ask how early you were for Sabbath school. He didn't ask how many Bible studies we gave. Uh, he didn't ask how many people we baptized or, or how much tithe and offering we gave. The commendation outlined here 
is not based on what we did in order to look good, nor is it based on what we know, but it's based on what we did to relieve the oppressed, to help those who were less fortunate than ourselves. How do we treat others that have not experienced the same privileges as we do? So I ask, what is our relationship with the men and women in our neighborhoods who don't have enough to eat? What, what is your position with those who don't have a place to live? Where are you with the sick and the shut-ins and the prisoners? How do you treat others who do not have the same benefits and ease and comfort that you do? I'm going to get to our main text, but I want to bring something else to our attention. You see, Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18 says that you shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. But, but God says you shall love your neighbor as yourselves. I am the Lord. You see, the idea of loving our neighbors as ourselves is not a New Testament concept. God gave that law to the Israelites way back in the Old Testament. You see, God always wanted his people to understand their responsibility to their brothers and sisters. God knew. God knew. He knew that Cain had killed Abel, but still, he asked, Cain, where is your brother Abel? This ought to tell us that we have a responsibility to tend to the needs and the concerns of our brothers and sisters. Even if I'm not directly responsible for my brother's misfortunes, I can be the catalyst for change that he needs. Just like God asked Cain for his brother, we too, we ought to hear God's voice asking us, where is your brother? And this question should prompt us to give an account to God of what we are doing to enhance the lives of our brothers and sisters. Now, now I don't know how familiar we are with our scripture passage for today. It's not one that, I've, that I hear read very often. and It's not one that I hear quoted or mentioned or preached on very often. But it references a previous passage in uh, Numbers, chapter 32. And that passage concerns the inheritance of the children of Israel. It, it talks about the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh receiving their allotted portion on the east side of the Jordan River before going into Canaan. Now the circumstances of them receiving their inheritance is what should first get our attention. God, God had promised all of the Israelites. He had promised them that they would inherit land. He would give them the land in Canaan. In fact, they were still outside of Canaan because of their unbelief, because God had already delivered them to the brink of their inheritance. But because of their unbelief, even though God delivered, uh, could deliver Canaan to them, they had been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. But now they were about to possess the land of promise. The tribes of Gad and Reuben came to Moses and they came with a proposal. The proposal was that instead of going into Canaan, they wanted the land uh, that they were standing on. And this is the land east of the Jordan River. See, God had led them in defeating the kings of the Amorites. And the land they stood on was fertile soil. Now, now this land, uh, the tribe of, of Reuben and Gad, uh, they had livestock. Apparently, they had more livestock uh, than the rest of the Israelites. 
You may remember that when they went down to Egypt, Joseph advised his brothers to tell Pharaoh that they tended to livestock. And, and I suppose it may be suggested, we can always suggest that these two tribes were more astute or maybe more diligent in tending to their flocks than the other tribes. And this may be why they had been, this may have been the reason that they had more livestock than the other tribes. Or, or maybe, maybe they were shrewd business people. And maybe this allowed them to gather more than the others. You see, after all, they were Jacob's uh, children. Jacob was their father, and he tended livestock, and they must have learned something from him. But whatever the reason, whatever the reason was, they had more livestock than the other tribes. And now that they were on ideal land for their livestock, where they could feed their livestock, where their stock could graze, they presented their request to stay on the east side of the Jordan because it was beneficial for them and for their prosperity. Now, when they presented their uh, request to Moses, Moses wasn't really happy at first. He wasn't pleased with what they were asking. You see, first of all, remember... Uh, Moses remembered that the last time they had a similar conversation, uh, the Israelites refused to go into Canaan. He, he had sent spies to Canaan, uh, apparently at the request of the Israelites, the children of Israel. But except for Caleb and Joshua, the spies came back with an evil report. A and the Israelites, based on that evil report, they refused to go into the land and to take possession. Had they accepted God's promise, they would have already been in Canaan. Had they accepted God's promise, they would, have, they would not have wandered around the desert. Had they accepted God's promise, Moses would have been in Canaan. You see, it was after their rebellion that Moses struck the rock so that they could get water. When he was told to speak to the rock, it was after their rebellion that Moses took credit for getting water for them from the rock when the glory should have been given to God and God alone. Uh, may I just pause here to parenthetically say that it is a hard thing to lead hard-headed people. You see, everybody wants to tell you what to do, but they don't want to put the work in to get it done. They want what they want, but they expect you to get it for them. Instead of working for themselves, they expect somebody else to do all the work and for them to get the glory. They don't do what is right. They don't do what is necessary. But they keep complaining about everybody else. It's a hard thing to lead hard-headed people. And if we're not careful, we will lose sight of what God is leading us to do, to the promises that God has given us. And those of us who choose to be hard-headed would end up dying in the wilderness and not receive God's promise. See, we think that we know what's right. We think that we know what's best. We try to overthrow the ones that God has put in place to lead. But we're kidding ourselves and we're killing ourselves when we try to take the reins from God and do what we think is right and what we think is best. See, I'm just talking Bible right here. If you read the book of Numbers, you'll see that when these people rebelled against God and they refused to do what God told them to do. They even turned against Moses and tried to overthrow him. But God was against the rebellion. And so the very promise that they should have received, the very promise that they were right on the brink of taking, of seizing, of, of, of claiming, they rejected it. And God had them wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And, and, and the, the condemnation was that they would not receive of the promise. See, what happened to the Israelites 
You'll see what happened to the Israelites when they disobeyed. You only hurt yourself. You only hurt yourself when you try to over overthrow God's people and God's will. So imagine, I imagine that, that Moses must have been upset when the Gadites and the Reubenites proposed that they take their possession on the east side of Jordan instead of going into Canaan. You see, it could have been seen as another rebellion, in which case it would, it would suggest that they would be bringing God's wrath on Israel and on themselves again. But for them, it was a practical request. They believed that it would be ideal for them to stay on that side of Jordan and take advantage of what the land offered, and their way, uh, what the land offered them, and their way and, and uh, means of living. And so it was not defiance, but an entreaty to be allowed to stay in an area that they believed was a pro was uh, was prosperous for them, as prosperous for them as Canaan. But there was another issue. How would this look to the other tribes? If those two tribes were allowed to inherit in Canaan, uh, uh, sorry, if they were allowed to not inherit in Canaan, but on this side of the Jordan, how, how would the other tribes view that? Why couldn't they get their inheritance on this side also? Why would they have to wait to go into Canaan to get theirs? So, in other words, it may not have been rebellion on the part of the Gadites, on the Reubenites, but because of what they were requesting, it could have been uh, interpreted by the other tribes as rebellion, and they themselves might have rebelled. And so the possibility of another rebellion, it was real. And so thinking of all this, I, I, I know if I were Moses, I would be upset. I would have every reason to blame their previous rebellion uh, for me not being allowed into the promised land. You remember God told Moses that he would not enter the promised land because he struck the rock when he was supposed to speak to the rock and then because he took glory for the water coming from the rock. And this was after they had rebelled. But at this point, Moses was still living. He was the one who had led them to the brink of the promise. And just as they were about to go in, they said no. And now they were about to go in again. These two tribes came a second time to again be allowed to not go in. But the people of Reuben and Gad, they were sincere in their request. And they were not rebelling, nor were they intending to incite rebellion. But there's another problem. You see, settling in Canaan uh, on the east side of Jordan was not going to be a matter of simply walking in and, and settling down. They had to fight for land. Wherever they were, they faced opposition. Now remember that the king, when the king of Moab, you might recall, when the king of Moab sent for Balaam uh, because he had heard of God, and, and how God was with the Israelites, and he was afraid. Uh, the very thought of God's people put fear in his heart, and put fear in the hearts of nations. Uh, victories don't come without fights. And God was fighting for Israel. And so in order for them to take possession of the land, they had to go and fight. And so the question Moses asked the Reubenites and the Gadites was this. He said, do you expect... For your brothers and your sisters to go and fight for their possession while you sit here? In other words, what about your brothers? Are you concerned about the impact that your decision will have on them? Are you concerned about them receiving what was promised to them? Or are you just thinking about yourself? In other words, if you get yours, will you care that they get theirs? Let me present to you that the problem was not with them being rich. And the solution did not include them giving up their possessions. It was not 
even about them sharing their wealth. Uh, Moses did not tell them that they had too much. He did not tell them that they should give up some of what they had. Rather, he told them that their responsibility to their brothers was that they had a responsibility to their brothers to help them to take possession of their promise. You should always, you should all be possessing the land, Moses said, together. And so what will become of your brothers and your sisters when you sit here and they go off to fight for their inheritance? What will become of your brothers and sisters when you sit in your cushy positions and don't care about the hungry, about the homeless, about the least, the lost, and the left out? Do you care what happens? Let me tell you something right now. I, uh, when, when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, when you allow Jesus to lead and direct your path, when you allow him to fight your battles, it puts fear in the heart of the devil. And your victory will come because Jesus has already conquered the devil and all of your foes. But in order, listen to me, in order for you to take possession of God's promises. You have to stand and fight, not with weapons of this world, but with the armor of God. For that's so that you can receive your inheritance. But what about those who have not had the same opportunities that you have? What about the immigrants that may not have come to this country the prescribed way, but came so that they could make a better life for themselves and for their families? What about the children who grew up without parents being in the home because both parents had to work in order to keep a roof over their heads? What about the grown folks who don't have an education, not because they didn't try in school, but because they were never diagnosed or helped with a disability that does not allow them to be able to read as easily as you can? What about those who are in school systems that failed them and allowed them uh, and did not uh, and sorry did, and allowed them to pass along uh, because no one wanted to deal with the real issues that concern, that caused them to misbehave? What about those who have real mental breaks and need someone to help them to understand the importance of taking their medication that will help them to achieve a balanced and healthy mind? What about those? who were raped and abused and have figured out how to deal with this world as they see it, or they have not figured out a way to deal with the world as they see it? Or what about those who felt uh, uh, that they had to steal or sell drugs in order to survive or take care of their families because no one would give them a job? What about those who were falsely accused of a crime that they did not commit, or, or maybe they were guilty, but they paid their debt to society? And still, they can't find a job because no one will hire them. What about those who have been trying with all that they, they know to do and still can't seem to get a break, and, and they, that the break that they need to help them get over the hump? What about those who have health issues because of the food that has been forced on them, but they can't get health care? What about the babies born to drug Sorry, what about the babies born to drug-addicted parents? whose brains did not develop properly enough for them to function as normally as we think they should? What about the drunk that, that has a generic predisposition in, to drinking that he inherited from his parents? What about those who do not know that Jesus saves? What about those who have not experienced the love of God? What about those who have not heard the gospel because we have not told them? See, the problem that we share with the Reubenites and the Gadites is that we seem to be only concerned about ourselves and our needs. We say, I've got mine, you, got your, you go get yours. In other words, I don't care about your problems. I don't care about your issues. That's not my problem. 
That's not my concern. That's not my business. You go take care of yourself. But I'm so glad that there was a response to Moses' rebuke. Uh, Numbers 16, sorry, Numbers 32, verse 16 says that the men came near to Moses and they had a solution. Uh, they said to Moses, they said, yes, we will build on the east side. They said we will establish ourselves on the east side. They said we would set things in order on the east side. But when the time comes for the rest of Israel to go and take possession of their inheritance, they said, we will leave what we have inherited and we will fight with those who did not yet get their rest. In other words, they would possess the inheritance, but they would not rest until everyone was able to take their inheritance and could rest. Let me find another way to say it. I've got mine. Let's go get yours. In fact, not only did they promise to fight, not only did they promise to fight with their brothers, but listen to what verse 16 says. They said, we will build sheepfolds here for our livestock and cities for our little ones. And verse 17 says, But we will take up arms, ready to go before the people of Israel, until we have brought them to their place. And our little ones shall live in the fortified cities because of the inhabitants of the land. We will not Verse 18, we will not return to our homes until each of the people of Israel has gained his inheritance. You see, the Reubenites and the Gadites, they had already moved on up to the east side. They already had their piece of the pie. They already had their possession. But they said, we will fight your fight with you. We will not have rest until you have rest. We will be on the front lines. We will lead the cause. We will be your advocates. We will risk ourselves so that you too can have your inheritance. Now, I hope you didn't miss that. We already got ours. But not only will we fight with you, we will fight on the front lines. We will lead the charge. We will risk our lives for you. They decided, they decided that if the rest of Israel could not take their inheritance, that they themselves could not rest. They would have no peace. You're all still wondering. If one is still wondering, we're all still wondering. If justice is denied for one, justice is denied for all. If, we're all, if, we're, if one of us is struggling, we're all still struggling. And so we must fight the good fight of faith. Because if you hurt, we hurt. If you don't rest, we don't rest. If you can't receive your blessings, we won't receive ours. So this, this is the example. This is the example that God gave us of what brotherly responsibility should look like. We should bind the wounds of those who are broken. We should, should advocate for those who are in need. Uh, we should be on the front lines when our brothers and our sisters are being shot and killed. This is how God wants us to treat our brothers and sisters, whether they are black or white, whether they're Christians or not, whether they're gay or straight. They are people for whom Jesus died and someone that he loves, and we should love them too. So 
Some of us might start thinking. As a matter of fact, that's what we do. Instead of finding reasons to help, instead of looking for opportunities to help, we often find the excuses of why we shouldn't help. We often come up with reasons and suggestions of why people are in the positions that they're in. Not remembering, not realizing that if it had not been for the grace of God, if it had not been for somebody looking out for your good or, or your father's good, then you too could be in that very same position. No, I'm, I'm not really the type of person that you would hear shouting anywhere that black lives matter. It does not mean that I don't think that black lives matter. I believe that black lives matter. And I also believe that all lives matter. But I do realize that if, there, if, if, if we all had this idea that all lives matter, if we really believe that all lives matter, that there would be no need for us now to be saying that black lives matter. Be because the issue seems to be that some lives uh, uh, seem to matter more than other lives. And so I, I don't usually get into debates about the social issues either because uh, while I do have an opinion, I often realize, I do, do also realize that too often we get distracted by what the incidents, the, the incidences are and, and, and we are not able to see the whole picture. And as a Bible believer, the bigger picture that we either don't see or we ignore is that this is not a battle of, fle of flesh and blood. You see, some of us, we try to get into fight, fighting as everybody else fights. But one of the things that we ought to notice in Numbers chapter, chapter uh, uh, 32 is that Moses corrected the children of Gad and Reuben because they, although they wanted to go before the other tribes and, and fight their cause, what they neglected to mention was that if God was not the one leading them, then their fight would be futile. And so as Christians, we too have a responsibility to get involved in the good fight of faith, to help those who are in need, to, to, to go out and be on the front lines, to share the gospel with others by meeting their temporal needs. Because when we meet their temporal needs, then they'll have the opportunity now to hear and to listen and to be receptive of what we have to share with them. But you see, Moses had to correct their understanding or, 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 or their ambition to go and fight with their brothers. Now, I want to also caution us or point us in the direction of what makes us brothers and sisters. You see, Acts 17, verse 26 Acts 17, verse 26, tells us that God has made of all men, of all nations of men, one blood. That means that we are all brothers and sisters. And it doesn't matter what our pigmentation is. It doesn't matter what our orientation is. It doesn't matter what side of the world that we came from. It doesn't matter whether we're rich or poor. It doesn't matter whether we're male or female, bond or free, God has made of all nations of men one flesh. No, that doesn't excuse sin. Because some of us will look at different orientations and say, well, I'm not going to fight with the gays because uh, they're gay, but how, how do you know what put them in that position? There are people who have been identifying as, as gay or LGBTQ or, uh, 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 or whatever the other acronyms are, but, but what got them there in the first place? Some of them it was because they were abused by individuals who claimed to be Christian believers. Uh, some of them were forced into a way of life that they may, maybe they didn't really uh, want to live, because, but because of their circumstances uh, or because of the pressures of somebody else, uh, that somebody has put on them. And we sit on our high horses in our lofty palaces. We sit in the church, and instead of helping, instead of reaching out with the gospel of Jesus Christ, we prejudge them. 
For God has made of all nations of men one blood. And so therefore, even in And I would dare say, especially in overcoming sin, we have a responsibility to our brothers and sisters, because we are brothers and sisters, to help one another to come to Jesus Christ. See, what got to me over the last few weeks was that I was looking at the news, and I saw basketball players I saw that basketball players decided that they would not play a game or one night uh, after, the Jacob, after Jacob Blake was shot. Shot in the back seven times by police officers. And when the basketball players decided that they would not, fight, would not play, it had a ripple effect. Because next came the baseball players. And after the baseball players decided that they would not play, then the football players decided they would not practice. And so it dawned on me, what are we doing? See, it seems as if we're more comfortable finding reasons to ignore or to point fingers on the perceived history of the victims than we are to help someone who is in need. And the question we should really consider is where would we be if Jesus had treated us the way we treat others? What also got to me was that a, another Christian church brother asked me one day, he said, why, why are the black folk in America complaining about the police coming in and killing them? when for all these years they've been killing themselves. And I want to suggest to you that there's a hypocrisy and in fact a lie in the way that the media has portrayed these unfortunate, these terrible events in black communities. See, I, I want to mention to us, to suggest to us that there are those in black communities, in all communities as a matter of fact, or, or, or should I say in all ethnic groups, there are those who are trying hard to stay above board, to work within the confines of the law. But for some reason, the opportunities that, that seem to be available for others don't present themselves to them. And, and, and so sometimes we become desperate enough to do things that we don't want to do in order to feed ourselves or in order to feed our families, in order to take care of our needs. And when the education in a certain community isn't available and, and then you can't get the job that you need to take care of yourself, never mind your family, when, when things are not as available to you as they seem to be for everybody else, and all that you need is just to have another meal, to keep a roof over your head, to keep your child warm. Sometimes, sometimes we take some extremes, we go to some extremes and do some things that we would not normally do. And so while I'm not offering an excuse for doing wrong, what I am saying is that when we sit back and do nothing to relieve the stress and the strain that our brothers and our sisters are experiencing, then we have no reason to judge them. One day, the day following, the day following the uh, work protest of the basketball players and baseball players, the senior advisor and son-in-law of the President of the United States, he said something to the effect that the basketball players, they have enough so that they don't stand anything to lose while they take the day off and, and that they were in a privileged position because others don't have that same, uh, that same opportunity. 
And some of us might be thinking the same thing, that they're already millionaires and, and, and uh, some of them on the verge to being billionaires. And so the millions of dollars that they already have, with the millions of dollars of, that they already have, they don't run a great risk by protesting. And, and so as a matter of fact, what great risk do they run by not protesting? By not protesting? And you see, that is the point, really, that they already have theirs. But they see a responsibility, a responsibility to use their platform to help to make life better for those who are less at peace. They already have theirs. And so they're trying to help somebody else to find some peace, to help somebody else to get theirs. And so the question I'm asking us is, what are we doing? We have in our churches the opportunity to reach and to help feed hundreds of people with the physical bread and then with the bread of life. But instead we quarrel about why we're doing so much and how we're going to pay for it. Uh, let me read again what Joshua said in the last sentence of, scripture, of, of our scripture passage. Here's what Joshua said in, in, in uh, Joshua chapter, chapter 1, verse 15, the last sentence. Joshua said, Then you shall return to the land of your possession and enjoy it, which Moses, the Lord's servant, gave you on this side the Jordan towards the sunrise. In, in other words, uh, uh, let me say that again. You shall return to the land of your possession and enjoy it. And I'll say it again. You shall return to the land of your possession and enjoy it. Just in case you missed it, I'll say it one more time. You shall return to the land of your possession and enjoy it. Here's the thing. Here's what it says. It says that there is assurance that when you have gotten yours and you help your brother to get theirs, there is assurance that you will return to your possession. And not only will you return to your possession, but you will enjoy it. You will enjoy it. That's the assurance of victory. See, when the tribes of Israel, when they refused to go into Canaan, it was rebellion. And when the two tribes requested to stay on the east side of Jordan, it could have been viewed as rebellion also. But God allowed them to possess a good land on condition that they were obligated. They were obligated. They were obligated to help their brothers get their inheritance also. So there was no indication of any possibility of failure. Because God had guaranteed them, he had assured them that they would conquer the land. God promised it. And God did it. And so the same way we can trust that whatever it is our undertaking is, whatever it is that God is leading us to do, that he will give us whatever we need so that we can do it. Victory! is assured. Ellen White says in Christ Subject Lessons, page 333, she said, all of his biddings are enablings. All of God's biddings are his enablings. In other words, if God called you to do it, he'll see to it that you can do it. He gives you everything you need to get it done. And so it's our Christian duty, our responsibility, our obligation to help others receive their inheritance and receive their blessings. Too often we focus on the preaching of the gospel and we seem to ignore that there is wisdom, sorry, we seem to ignore the wisdom that is needed to reach others with the gospel. What I want to share with us is a couple of quotes as I'm closing. A couple of quotes from Ellen White that speak to us about the wisdom of sharing the gospel. Here's what she says in Ministry of Health and Healing, page 74. She says, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with people as one who desired their good. 
He showed sympathy for them and ministered to their needs and won their confidence. And then he invited them, follow me. Jesus met the needs of the people. And then he bid them, follow me. Christian service, page 13. It says, to everyone who becomes a partaker of his grace, the Lord appoints a work for others. To everyone who becomes a partaker of his grace, the Lord appoints a work for others. To every one of us who become partakers of God's grace, he has appointed a work for us. That means you, and that means me. Individually, we are to stand. Individually, we are to stand in our lot and place, saying, here I am, send me. Upon the minister of the word, the missionary nurse, the Christian physician, the individual Christian, whether he be merchant or farmer, professional man or mechanic, the responsibility rests upon all. It is our work to reveal to men the gospel of, the sal of their salvation. Every enterprise in which we engage should be a means to this end. When the master of the host called his servants, he gave to them, to every man, his work. The whole family of God are included in the responsibility of using, God's, of using the Lord's goods. Every individual, from the lowest and most obscure to the greatest and most exalted, is a, mor is a moral agent endowed with abilities for which he is accountable to God. You got yours. Are you helping somebody else to get theirs? The last one, last one, Councils and Stewardship, page 52. Councils and Stewardship, page 52. It says, The great outpouring of the Spirit of God, which lightens the whole earth with His glory, will not come until we have enlightened people that know by experience what it means to be laborers together with God. Let me read that again. The great outpouring of the Spirit of God, which lightens the whole earth with His glory, will not come until we, by experience, I'm sorry, until we have an enlightened people that know by experience what it means to be laborers together with God. When we have entire wholehearted consecration to the service of Christ, God will recognize the fact by an outpouring of His Spirit without measure. When we have entire wholehearted consecration to the service of Christ, God will recognize the fact by an outpouring of His Spirit without measure. When we have an entire wholehearted consecration to the service of Christ, God will recognize the fact by an outpouring of His Spirit without measure. But, but this will not be while the largest portion of the church are not laborers together with God. God cannot pour out His Spirit when selfishness and self-indulgence are so manifest. When a spirit prevails that if put to word, into words would express the answer of Cain, am I my brother's keeper? God did not directly answer Cain's question. But throughout biblical history, throughout biblical history, God has answered that question. You are your brother's keeper. You are your brother's keeper. You got yours. It's your responsibility, your duty, your obligation to help somebody else to get theirs. You know, what's really interesting, what's really interesting 
is that we seem to think that our salvation is a personal issue. And yes, it is personal because we have to make the decisions for ourselves of our own, on our own to accept God's salvation. But you see, when you accept Jesus and you become his disciple, you are no longer your own. And so the mandate is, the mandate is to go into all the world and make disciples. Go into all the world and make disciples. And Jesus told his disciples, he said, start first in Jerusalem. In other words, start in your own city. And then he said in Ju Ju Judea, start in, in your own area. And then he said in Samaria, in other words, you can start spreading out from there. And then to the uttermost parts of the world. Are we our brother's keeper? Yes, we are. And that means we have a responsibility to the world to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Share one last verse with you, one last passage of scripture with you. It's in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. Luke 4, 18 and 19. And this was Jesus' first uh, uh, sermon on the Sabbath in church. And here's what Jesus said. Reading from Isaiah, he picked up the scriptures and he started reading. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. We have a responsibility to reach our brothers and sisters whatever way we can, with our food pantry, with, 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 with our job preparation, with, with child care, with, with visiting the prisons. And I understand that right now things may be challenging and we might have to figure out a different way to reach the way that we, we should be reaching. But today, God is calling to us. And he has given us the requirements, the criteria by which we will be judged. The question I ask you, are you your brother's keeper? I've got mine. Let's go get yours. I want to appeal to your hearts today. For you to not only give Jesus your heart, but give him your service. Because there are men and women, boys and girls, all around us who are in need. And while we see the end result of what the needs can do, what we are not seeing is the reasons behind how they got there. And sometimes that's not even any of our business. Because God, Jesus never gave us the mandate to go find out what people need so that you can help them, but to go and meet the need. Not find out how they got into position that they get in, but go help fill the need. And so God is calling us to do a work differently to what we've become accustomed to. To not only reach people with the good news that is presented in the Bible, but present them with the good news of love, of care, of compassion, of helping, of service, so that they can come to know him also. So my appeal to every one of us is that we would reach out to our brothers and sisters and we will show them the love and care and, con and concern that God has shown for us. And know that we've gotten ours. Let's help others to get theirs. Father, we thank you for your word again, which reveals to us plainly that we have a responsibility to our brothers and our sisters to bind the, the wounded, to heal the broken, to take in the stranger, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to visit the imprisoned. And, and Lord, while things may look differently to what we've become accustomed to, while, while things may not uh, look exactly the same as we read them in the scripture, 
Help us to understand that what Jesus has called us to do, what you have called us to do, is to reach the hearts of men and women with love and compassion and caring so that we can reach them with the words of life. Because what will it matter if we're telling them to, 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 be, to be faithful if they don't, don't understand what being faithful is? What will it matter if we're telling them to trust you if we ourselves have not demonstrated to them how we trust you by sharing what we have with them? How can we tell others to trust you when, when, when they don't know who you are? And how can we tell, uh, uh, expect anyone to listen to us when their stomachs are rumbling? How can we expect anyone to listen to us when we really don't care about their needs and their concerns? And as someone said, people really don't care how much we know until they know how much we care. So may our lives change. Change us first so that we can reach those who need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. But not only hear it with the words that we say, but also see it demonstrated in the way that we live. And as your servant said, Lord, Christ's method alone is what will, be, will bring true success. He mingled with men and women as one who cared about their needs. He met their needs, and then he bade them to follow him. We pray, Father, that we will adopt Christ's method and tell others about the goodness of Jesus. Because those of us who think that we've already inherited their here on this earth, we might be living okay now, but what you have promised really is for us to live with you forever. And so, Father, the word says that when the gospel of the kingdom is preached in all the world as a witness, then the end will come. So we pray, Lord, we ask that you help us to do our part to preach the gospel of the kingdom in this world so that we can together get ours. The promise that you've given us to receive eternal life. Keep us faithful to this cause and to your word. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.